Good afternoon and welcome to the MIT Alumni Career Lunch and Learn webinar series. My name is Ellen Stahl and I'm the MIT Alumni Career Counselor and will serve as host and moderator for today's workshop. Our webinar is being broadcast live and we are collecting questions from you throughout the presentation. Please type your questions in the chat box on the lower right side of the WebEx window. The questions you type will not be seen by the audience and will only be seen by myself so that confidentiality can be respected. This webinar is being recorded and we will upload it and make it available to you online one week from today. Slides from today's webinar will also be available to those who attended today's presentation and we will send those to you via email. A few technical notes before we get started. We have over 300 people on our online audience today, but again, for privacy, you cannot see any of the other attendees. Also, please know that you're all muted and can only ask questions via the chat box. If you can see the presentation slides right now but cannot hear us, try using your phone instead of your computer to dial into the audio portion. You'll find that information in the chat box. Our topic today is develop your negotiation power. This webinar is scheduled from 12 o'clock to 1 p.m. We will hear from our presenter until about 12.35ish, at which time we will open up our Q&A portion of the program. Please type your questions again into the chat box at any time during the webinar. You don't need to wait until the Q&A segment. Before we get started, I want to introduce you to our presenter today. We are extremely fortunate to have with us as our content expert, MIT alumnus Jonathan Levine. Jonathan is a Boston-based executive and career coach, specializing in engineering leadership and career development. He provides management training and coaching to help lead innovation teams more effectively and works with clients to make successful engineering career transitions. He is a 14-year veteran of product development organizations in high-tech startups and is also a CEO of his own high-tech venture. Jonathan, welcome and thank you for sharing your expertise with us today. I hand it over to you. Thank you very much, Ellen. It's a pleasure to be back. And so as Ellen pointed out, we're going to be talking about negotiation power, negotiating power. Uh, this is a topic that... Um, I think is definitely relevant for many of us, independent of what uh, your current position is and your current situation, whether you're in transition, if you're thinking about making a transition, if you are currently employed and just thinking about how to better negotiate your current compensation. So we'll get into all of those things. Um, so as Ellen pointed out, uh, I'm a Boston-based executive and career coach. Uh, I specialize in engineering, having come out of MIT and spent uh, over a decade and a half in commercial software engineering. Um, so some of the work I do with engineering executives and mid-level managers involves helping them to better lead innovation through building some of the soft skills, uh, communication, influence, team building, change management, and leading uh, successful career transitions is also something I do. Um, what makes me a little bit different than a, a number of other uh, career coaches out there is that I approach career development, my philosophy is, that career development is really a leadership development activity. And through developing your career, it's really an opportunity to learn how to better lead yourself and then also how to transcend your career to create a greater sense of purpose in your life, uh, how to reveal who you are meant to be, and how to build the skills to help you leverage this. Uh, so as Ellen pointed out, so I, I spent 15 years in engineering, product management, product marketing, uh, in high-tech startups. Uh, I currently serve as a leadership coach and facilitator at Harvard Business School in their Department of Executive Education. And most importantly, I'm a uh, Core 6 alum, um, did an SB back in 97 and a Master's of Engineering in 98. So today, um, the agenda is, um, we'll quickly review just some of the challenges of this topic, what makes negotiating uh, challenging. We'll talk about why bother Okay, why bother to uh, try to develop some of your negotiation skills? And then I'll give you a, a simple framework to help you develop um, better power in your negotiations 
by leveraging what's happening outside of you, the, the uh, leverage that you're able to exert during the negotiation, the legitimacy you're able to, uh, to use in that process, as well as what you bring personally to the negotiation, how confident are you, and ways of developing your own sense of clarity about what's important. And we'll end with some resources. Um, we, we really want to make this interactive, so at any point, as Ellen indicated, please send your questions. And, um, and I hope to hear them as they come in and, you know, time allowing uh, may pause throughout just to answer those. And if there are some I couldn't get to throughout the presentation and we've got time, you know, happy to, to answer those as well at the end. We were trying to make it interactive as well by putting up a poll, but I guess for some reason the poll is not uh, allowing people to respond. So if in your chat box you could just indicate for Jonathan and myself, right now, are you currently looking to perhaps renegotiate your current job or are you looking to negotiate a new job opportunity? If you could just type in some results for us into the chat box, just so again we can tailor the conversation to what's most relevant to the audience today. That would be great. And um, Ellen will be jumping in as as questions come in and um, do my best to answer those. So what makes this such a charged topic? Um, you know, effective negotiation, uh, it requires having a difficult conversation, and that can be about um, where we want our career to go, uh, how we're feeling about where we currently are, um, and uh, if, if we're having that conversation with a manager, especially if it's outside of a, of a performance review where there's you know, a lot of feedback that's given to us. It's not an easy conversation for many of us to have. Um, certainly to feel comfortable having this conversation, we have to believe, which is really critical, that we're worth what we're asking. Otherwise, you know, our, uh, our manager, whoever the other party is, they'll see right through us. And so part of this exercise, as I'll, I'll get into, is to really internally uh, feel like you're, you're valuable enough to be asking what you're asking for, but then also to have the skills and the techniques to, to thoroughly apply that. So uh, uh, salary.com recently did uh, a survey. They do it every year. Uh, in this, I think in 2015 they did uh, a survey of 730 people who are either in transition or currently employed and asked them, you know, what, among other things, are – some of the top reasons why you're not negotiating salary. Uh, and the top three reasons that they listed were fear, stress, and lack of confidence. So that, the, the, that sort of validates this idea that uh, your sense of, of self-worth, your, your confidence in approaching this topic is really uh, central to being able to want to engage in it. Um, I also just wanted to share some common myths that uh, came out of uh, some of, of Salary.com's research in 2014, um, and, and this resonates certainly with uh, some of my clients too, a common fear that many people have in, in negotiating is, I'm just, I'm, I'm afraid I'll hear no. And the reality is, as Salary.com found out, that 84% of the employers that they surveyed expect candidates and employees to negotiate salary. Another common myth is uh, some people might feel that uh, by engaging in negotiation for a new job opportunity, that they just may lose it. They may lose that opportunity because of the fact that they're trying to negotiate around salary. And what um, their research showed in 2014 is only 13% of employers rescinded a job offer because there was a negotiation around it. So again, there there is some expectation that people are going to do this, and, and it's unlikely to result in losing out on an opportunity. Another common fear that people have, which, uh, um, again, it translates to a myth, is they may fear that if they're an employee that they could be fired or demoted for asking for a raise, and nobody that salary.com uh, surveyed in terms of the employer said that they had ever fired or, or demoted someone who asked for a raise. You know, often these are just simply placeholders for a confidence issue, and that's fine. It's just important to see that clearly. Looks like, Jonathan, from the polling, that it's definitely a blend. I have a sense that people are perhaps looking to 
renegotiate their current position, but perhaps are also looking for outside opportunities as well and really trying to perhaps um, try to just better themselves in either space, depending on who's going to come up with the best value. Okay, that's good to know. So certainly when you're a current employee and you're also considering what else is out there and potentially going to be negotiating over a new uh, position, that gives you the greatest leverage, which we'll get to in a minute. So um, that's good to hear. So why, why bother to do this? Why bother to even try to develop you know, better negotiation skills? So first of all, there's the obvious reason financially. Um, so uh, imagine for a moment, I'm just going to paint a scenario for you. Imagine I'm in mid-career as an engineer. I'm about to land a new job with a $100,000 salary. Let's just define a round number here. And let's say that um, my salary will grow year over year by 3% uh, because of inflation and bonuses and whatnot. Um, and, and I'm faced with the question of, do I negotiate a $5,000 increase um, over this new job? Why bother do it, doing it for $5,000? So we, when we're facing that question, we, we, we tend to think of an initial negotiated raise like this. So here's just a graph of what the default salary would be at a 3% per year increase over time versus what it would be if I had negotiated initially a $5,000 increase in year zero. So we tend to think year over year as it's just a small incremental change to what I'm earning right now. So why bother? Um, in reality, you know, that initial negotiated raise compounds over time. So I just, you know, went through and, and made a graph here of what that $5,000 cumulatively adds up to year over year. So year 10, for instance, over $60,000 cumulatively by year 10. And it turns out if you do the math over 20-year period, that initial $5,000 adds up to over $140,000. So there's clear financial reasons to want to negotiate, even something small like a few thousand dollars. But also, perhaps more importantly, there's a big impact potentially to your career satisfaction. Um, so for most of us, our natural inclination is just to focus on the numbers, uh, focus on the salary, and, and if you have the ability to, to negotiate over benefits, even better. Um, but this is just the tip of the iceberg, which we'll get to in a little bit. Um, the often overlooked um, benefits of, of engaging in negotiation and, and using these steps I'll be presenting here is that it can help you negotiate over the intangibles, the non-financials, that over time people tend to find help them to better realize their values and create more meaningful career and more meaningful advancement for them personally than just simply money. Uh, for personal development, that's another key reason. I, again, speaking as a leadership coach, I encourage you also to use negotiation over compensation as an opportunity to d develop those soft skills that you haven't had a chance to that may impede you in your personal and professional life. So that could include being assertive, dealing with conflict, being persuasive, uh, demonstrating credibility and just communicating more effectively. So these are really muscles that can be developed just like technical skills and, and just like muscles, the more you use them, the stronger they get. And if you ignore them over time, they, they tend to atrophy. So uh, here's the framework I'll be presenting to develop greater negotiating power. I, I practice martial arts, so I I was trying to find a theme that ties this all together, and I think in many respects uh, the, this yin and yang symbol really does because it, martial arts is often about developing the, what's called mind-body development, the, the, the ability for the mind and the body to really work together and for physical development to help in your mental development and mental development to be expressed physically as well. And that's, that's really, I think, a valuable concept in negotiating compensation too. We're going to be talking about external power, so how to create external uh, leverage and how to, to use legitimacy uh, as a source of power to try to get what you want in your negotiations, and internal power to have the confidence and the clarity uh, to uh, to really approach this in in a very 
mindful, present way. And both of these are needed. So external power gives you the tools you can use with the other person when you're negotiating. And the internal power gives you the energy and it gives you the presence to use those tools effectively. So as we jump in again, as, as you have any questions, um, please feel free to type those into the window and um, we'll be fielding them uh, as we get them. Let's start with leverage as our first uh, external tool. So uh, in the, the, the field of negotiation, and, and the, the best thinking on this has come out of the Harvard program on negotiation, which is part of the law school, so all lawyers need to be really effective negotiators. Um, probably the biggest finding is that your viable alternatives are your primary source of external power, your ability to walk away. Certainly if you've traveled to bazaars and, and um, lively markets in, in you know, the far-flung corners of the world, you'll have this experience too. But this also holds in our uh, uh, career negotiations, in our, our compensation negotiations, um, and and uh, so a viable alternative is where you go if you walk away, and it doesn't necessarily mean like if you're an employee that you quit your job. It can mean just having a viable alternative to use, and it has to be viable in the sense that it's an alternative you really would want to engage in if you don't get what you feel you need where you are. Um, one important piece of language is uh, or I should say a concept, is your BATNA, which stands for your best alternative to a negotiating agreement, negotiated agreement. So of all the alternatives that you have, which one is the best? Um, that's going to be a big source of leverage in your current negotiation. And um, in negotiation, preparation is everything. So as you prepare, it's critical to understand, first for you, well, what, first of all, are your alternatives? What is your best one? What is your BATNA? What can you do to improve your BATNA during the negotiation? And this is often overlooked uh, by people when they're in a, uh, a formal job search or even when they're contemplating it. Um, it's also helpful to understand what, all the, what are the alternatives for a particular employer? What is their BATNA? And this is also something that's really overlooked. We'll, we'll, uh, talk a bit about this um, in just a moment to give you a specific example. But you can think of this as a seesaw. So in terms of leverage, whoever has the strongest BATNA has the greatest leverage. And so it's important to not only understand and develop yours, but really to understand theirs uh, for each employer that you're dealing with. So let's imagine that you are interested in a new position and you want to be, prepare for a negotiation because you get the sense that um, you could be a good fit and they would want you and this is coming. Uh, so first to understand their BATNA, the employer's BATNA, um, there's some questions you can ask. What's the pain behind the position? So what's driving the, this position? There's um, always pain that uh, is organizational pain that's behind a new opening. Somebody who's overworked, uh, it could be somebody who's leaving and that work isn't being covered by someone else. It could be expansion and the inability to, to deliver product to meet a market need uh, or um, an opportunity that exists for a brief period. And, and if there's delay because of a lack of capacity, um, then you're, you know, the company's going to miss out on this opportunity. So um, as you can learn about this during the interviewing process. Try to understand what's the cost to the company of doing nothing, of not hiring this position. What's the cost of delay? And you can ask this in interviews when you bring in some questions, you know, for your hiring manager. What, what would happen if you didn't fill this position? What would happen if it took you an extra three months or an extra six months uh, longer than you're intending right now? You can also assess for yourself how rare is your experience or skill. It obviously will depend greatly um, for each of you. Um, for the employer, it's really, I think, helpful to ask how long they've been looking to fill this position, as well as um, what do other candidates look to them? So what does your competition look like? Um, 
and some of my clients sometimes tell me, oh, you know, the hiring manager is not going to answer that question and neither will HR, which may be, uh, but who your prospective peers would be, those people often answer that question directly because they love to just give their opinion. So if, if you don't get straight answers about who your competition is, what was some of their strong points and what were some of their negative points from the hiring manager HR, ask your, your potential peers when you interview them, and usually you'll find you'll get um, a straight answer there. Um, now on to your BATNA uh, for this new position. One of the best things you can do uh, to create alternative offers that you can then play off each other is to develop them around the same time. So if you think of the hiring process as, as just a series of steps that start with you know, discovering opportunities, um, applying, getting in the door for interviews, resulting in an offer and some negotiation, and then finally you accept one of those offers. Um, one of the best things you can do, and I think this is particularly helpful for those of you who are employees who are also, you know, considering a move, is to, uh, in order to end up being able, at the end of that process, to have multiple offers and play them off each other, work backwards so that you begin your search around the same time. And once you get in the door for interviews, you want to try to fast track your searches through other companies so that you can get in the door for interviews around the same time with the, the hope of, you know, multiple companies providing offers at around the same time. Uh, if some of them have quicker timelines than others, you can ask for extensions so that those timelines overlap and you've got alternatives and can then use those to play offers off of each other. And so it's a simple idea. Um, a lot of times we don't think when we're in the process of how to work backwards from the outcome we want to uh, try to develop alternatives at the very uh, earliest step of, of our job search. Now, what if you're in you know, a current position, you're, you're in a current employee, um, and you're interested in, in renegotiating uh, your current uh, compensation to try to, to, to have greater leverage. So, again, first understand the company's BATNA. So, you know, how would the company fare without you? Um, this is something that you would have to obviously ask indirectly. You may get different answers. You may have your own view of the matter. But I think it's really important to um, test your thinking you know, with different people that you trust within the company. Um, try to assess how unique and critical your skill set is, your experience, your knowledge. How many other people, if you weren't there, could pick up the slack? What, how long would it take? If it would it be, you know, three months for them to get up to speed? Would it be a year or longer? And what impact would that likely have? You know, so you'll have some ideas on this, but validate them with people you trust so that you could try to get to a, a more objective answer. Jonathan, can, that, uh, mm -hmm. sorry, can we just go back one sec to the sort of fast track concept and could yeah. you maybe offer one or two suggestions on what you mean by fast track and how you might convey that to an employer? When you say fast track, are you referring to the diagram on the right? Fast track um, in terms of if you start to get into a scenario where you have multiple interviews and you want to be able to fast track the process in hopes to end up at the same junction of opportunities. Can you talk yeah, a little so, bit about that? Um, it, it's a good question. And so um, a lot of times if, if you do have, uh, say, one, one company that really wants to move quickly and uh, you're unable to or they're unwilling to uh, slow their process down, say they have some tight timelines, you could go to the other companies you're interviewing with and saying, Here, here's a situation I'm in. I've been interviewing with this other company for a while. They're really keen on me. Um, I really want to see this process through where you, you know, at your company, because I like what I'm seeing. Can you work with me here? Because, um, you know, especially if this if the other company, the fast moving one, is one that you're leaning towards, you can communicate, and this is this is how you play off of each other. You can communicate that um, I need you to help me out here so that we can move things along, 
so that I'm not forced to make a decision without uh, finishing uh, this process with you. And a lot of employers will do what they can there. You know, it can simply be a scheduling issue to make sure that uh, they they get interviews with the right people and they, they have a, a decision-making meeting. And if they really like you, that can be something that they work toward. They, the best you know, companies, employers know that the best people are always sought after by, by multiple companies. So if they view you as a really strong candidate, they'll expect that companies will be jumping after you and that they'll have to compete for you. Great. Thanks. That's very helpful. So great question. Uh, so for those of you who are current employees, uh, we talked a little bit about how to understand and assess the company's BATNA. For your BATNA, your best alternative, what are opportunities uh, at your current company to move within it? What are some alternatives to just where you are, but that are also within the current company? Um, certainly, some employers are not keen on this. I know um, shortly out of grad school as an engineer, I worked for a big employer here in Boston that was not keen on internal moving uh, or um, internal um, moving between positions. And the only way that people tended to move up at that company is that they tended to leave and then come back later. So, so that may be the case for some of you. It may require that you interview just to see what's out there, but also to create some leverage for you to be able to negotiate more effectively for the, the next step in your career. And the important thing to consider there is uh, are you creating viable alternatives? If you if you really want to stay at your current company no matter what, then you, you, you just won't have any viable alternatives. In, in your heart of hearts, if you know you're never going to leave because you just love it that much, then don't bother going through the motions. But if you think you can really find a viable alternative that can be just as exciting and cool and fun, um, then that's when you, you've, you've got the, the ability to, to really potentially walk away. And that's what you need to create leverage. So that, that source of leverage, is, it, it is a major source of external power. Uh, the, the second one is legitimacy. And there's, there's even more, but I'm trying to boil down the sort of top two sources of external power here. So legitimacy is what makes this seem like it's not an arbitrary process, that there's some kind of objective information that um, that you can you can turn to and that your employer will recognize. That's really what you're you're looking for here. So to develop legitimacy, you want to find external objective criteria. It could be standards. It could be norms that just go beyond you know corporate habits or policies. And this is important for two reasons. So it can be a sword. It can help you to support an ask that you're making and to to uh, champion that as best you can, but it can also be a shield in case the the employer is making an unfair ask of you and you want to defend against that. For example, um, if the employer, if their initial offer is way, way low and you've got uh, the facts to show that. So many employers actually use offers not only as a way to potentially get uh, a, a new um, candidate in the door, but also as a way of testing what is the marketplace doing. So if you report back to them, I'm finding that this is a low number and here's why, and you show their f the facts behind that, that's actually helpful data for them beyond just hiring you. Uh, so one of the major ways of asserting your value is really to do your homework and prepare and to do it along four dimensions. So make sure that your asks are aligned to your responsibilities. Research trends, uh, try to structure incentives as best you can, and improve your performance. So we'll, we'll dig into each of these uh, next. So aligning to responsibilities. Uh, it's, it's important whether you're in and, you know, or applying for a new position or you want to negotiate your current position, that you benchmark your responsibilities against those that others have in your role to see if what you're really doing is actually a more senior job, and you just haven't perhaps noticed it before, and the company hasn't really noticed it. So some of the questions to ask 
when you do this, when you get data on the responsibilities that uh, other people have in, in a similar role, so are you in fact doing something more senior, whether or not it's been recognized? Is your title truly representative of what you do? One of the best ways to do this is simply just to get a series of job descriptions. If you're an engineering manager, it could be you get five or ten job descriptions at similar companies just to see, well, what are the common skills, what are the common experiences, um, and to build a profile of those. And that, that's what you know is representative of the responsibilities for your role. And if you're you know, acting above that, then you know uh, that your your compensation you know, might not actually be aligned with your responsibilities. So salary.com also has job profiles, so you can search by title and find the profiles that describe at a high level what are the responsibilities and experience needed for certain roles. Well, let's just take a common, you know, couple examples that at least I run into very frequently, um, where, you know, people's actual job and their title and their role isn't really aligned with their responsibilities because they've actually been doing something more senior. So as an engineer, if, if you're already, you know, not only acting as an individual contributor, but you're leading and directing the work of others on the team, that's a very classic case. Whether you have formal authority or not, if you're directing their work, you're starting to perform a, a managerial role. If you're an engineering manager, uh, if, uh, you are starting to shape the, the vision uh, for how to achieve a strategy for the team or how to achieve um, you know, a particular goal for the team. If you're recruiting and scaling the team to achieve that vision, if you're continuously trying to mature some of the processes on the team, those are ones that often uh, start to bleed over. Those responsibilities often bleed over into a more senior quasi-director or VP role. So that's important uh, you know, to consider, and I, I do see this frequently. Um, Jonathan? This happens. Yeah. Do you think that there's any difference in this strategy depending on if you're younger or older? I know there's a lot of age discrimination out there. So if someone is 60 plus, would this still be the same strategy you would use, or might you have a different angle? You know, I, employers, they try to follow the law by and large, and you, you can't discriminate based on age. Um, these, are, these, I think, happen to people young and old. When you stay in a company a long time or you've gone through a lot of organizational change, responsibilities drift, and the longer you stay, the more they tend to drift. So I think uh, this... This advice of making sure that as you're making your argument and looking for ways to, to leverage legitimacy, that you compare what other people in, your, in other companies do uh, for your type of role and compare whether you're actually starting to take on more senior responsibilities. I think that, that will work whether you're young or you're an older employee. Great, thanks. Um, so, in general, I think you're trying to put together an argument that my compensation should be commensurate with my responsibilities, and that's a pretty reasonable, logical argument. So, if you can demonstrate that, that can help to give your argument some legitimacy. Research market trends, so, um, you know, this is an obvious one that uh, we think of in concept, maybe we don't often use enough, but, but research, what are ranges? of compensation for your responsibilities. So there's plenty of great places to go to for this. You could look at salary.com, payscale, indeed.com, Glassdoor. They all have different um, sources of research for compensation ranges. Try to keep in mind that some of those figures may be national, so you want to make sure that you localize them or that you're looking at localized figures for your geography. So standards of living obviously differ across some geographies. So a lot of times, I think these tools will make it clear. They'll ask you, you know, what's your zip code or your um, city and town, 
and they'll show you figures for that region. But if they, they're not or there's any question about that, you may need to apply, you know, some kind of factor um, to, to scale that based on the cost of living for your region. And, of course, you know, ask your colleagues. Ask your friends. Recruiters are also a good source of information. For, you know, what's a, a, a range that uh, is, is what the market is paying for this type of work? Um, other market trends to watch, cost of living adjustments. So for those of you who are employees, if you haven't negotiated for a while, and most people haven't, you should be tracking this at least once a year. Um, so cost of living adjustments are typically done relative to the CPI, the Consumer Price Index. That's an index for what a, a basket of goods, the same basket of goods, costs over time in the U.S. Um, there's plenty of uh, inflation calculators you can calculate out there that are based on this. I know Social Security in, here in the U.S. has uh, various adjustments for COLA cost of living adjustments that are based off of the CPI. So you should be able to see year after year what uh, what is my salary, what should my salary rise to in order to have the same purchasing power that it did last year. And um, one of the things that Payscale found, and you can find this research on their website, is in 2014, over 20% of employers surveyed, uh, they said that cost of living adjustments is their main reason for giving raises. So this is, uh, this can be an effective argument when you're trying to make the case for a change year over year. Uh, a third source of legitimacy is simply to get buy-in you know, on, on what it is that you want early and make it really clear. So structure any kind of incentives for raises or bonuses in advance. So you clear, measurable, unambiguous criteria. Um, make sure you've got control over hitting the target. So if at the beginning of the year your manager says, here, let's do some goal planning, you know, a best practice is to make sure that it's clear what you need to achieve, what you need to demonstrate in order to justify a raise, and make sure that all of those things are within your control. Like if, it's, if the company's financial performance is part of the mix, unless you're in sales, you know, or you're somehow uh, managing headcount as a senior manager or VP, that's probably something you don't have direct control over. There's a concept for this. It's called management by objectives or MBOs. Um, so you can use that language when you describe this. And it's, it's just really important to get it in writing. It happens a lot that, you, you know, senior managers uh, give a verbal agreement to something and then you know, time slips and, and um, people's recollections of that um, tend to slide. Um, so some examples might be in terms of a structured incentive, you know, you might have, look, if I deliver this release on time, especially if you're a manager and have direct control over it, then that would qualify, you know, for um, a raise of X percent by the end of the year. Implementing really specific key big functionality if you're an individual contributor, uh, maybe perhaps completing some research or presenting your findings on a topic by the end of the year. So link that to goal setting at the beginning of the year in order to structure this raise. Lastly, for legitimacy, improve your performance. So I know you know a few of us really love the performance reviews. But they do have a useful purpose in terms of helping you and forcing you to collect the evidence for making the case. And the timing of that is useful for, for um, demonstrating some legitimacy around your ask. So if you've got a good review, if you've got checkboxes that were all above expectations, now is the time to make your ask. And if there isn't an offer coming from the company, now's the time for you to make that ask. Um, you know, it, it, it sounds obvious, but in Payscale survey in 2014, they surveyed over 5,500 business leaders from companies of every size across a wide, a wide sector of industries. And in 2014, over half of the employers said uh, the main reason for us for giving raises is employee performance. So if you're demonstrating great performance and you're not getting a raise, that's the time to ask. Um, so again, the best time to, to uh, the best way to create a link between pain performance is to set expectations when goal setting at the beginning of the year. So negotiate at the beginning of the year uh, over that bonus. What would the bonus be? 
uh, what would you need to demonstrate? So ask open-ended questions. What would justify a raise in your mind? Um, what, what targets would I need to hit to, to achieve this raise? And try to get that in writing and structure it so that it's clear. Uh, we're going to switch gears now into internal power. Uh, we've been talking about external tools you can use, but at the end of the day, if you're not confident and if you don't really believe that you're worth it, um, it's going to be really, really hard for you to engage in this. So the internal power is just as important as some of these external tools. So this negotiation requires more than just tools. You have to believe you're worth it, and this is something you can shift if you naturally don't have a lot of confidence. So one of the ways to do it is to research the objective uh, measures of your impact. So measure the impact to your company, measure the impact to your customers, and when you do that, you become more conscious of uh, what you've actually done, and that can actually help to shift your own thinking. So you can do that through revenues and costs and measuring what impact you had on that. Um, you can um, get colleagues to help you quantify that. Um, for revenue, let's just take a couple examples and then we'll move on. Um, uh, what role did you help to, to generate new business or repeat business? I'll just give you a couple examples. Uh, one example for revenue, and then we'll turn turn to one for cost. So um, let's let's imagine for a moment. This is uh, ripped from the headlines. One of my clients. So let's imagine you're a product manager, and you persuaded the engineering team to shift priorities at a certain point in time to save this new customer deal that uh, is for a SaaS service, so there's some subscription revenue. So um, if, if your shift resulted in saving that customer uh, from, you know, uh, walking away, if this was a critical feature and it was a limited time period in which the customer needed to have this delivered to sign a deal, um, that's critical to know, well, what is the subscription revenue that customers bring in? In the case of my client, it was $200,000 a year, and there was only so much time to actually uh, get a formal agreement signed before that budget was going to move on and get allocated somewhere else. So there was time pressure there. And so this product manager, essentially through, through persuasion of his engineering colleagues, was able to save about $5 million. If you... Um, talk to a, a finance colleague, you know, the present value of a stream of perpetual payments at 4% interest adds up to close to $5 million. So that's a huge uh, source of, of potential confidence building, you know, for, for that product manager. What about cost savings? Most of us in engineering are on the cost side of the business. You know, we're not directly selling. So um, here's, a, here's an example again. Uh, from one of my clients. This is an engineer who achieved a three-week reduction in quarterly release times through designing and implementing process improvements. I'm sure some of you have done something like that. So in this particular case, my client um, and uh, four of his colleagues were earning about $100,000 a year. So when you take into account benefits, the, the company was spending about $150,000 a year. And so the dollar value of those three week savings, if you do the math on it, it was about $43,000 per release per quarter. And that translates to about $170,000 a year. And that's something that this engineer can point to and say, hey, I saved that just simply because of the time saving. Uh, measure your impact to customers. So, uh, you know, briefly, if you can find what your work did for customers emotionally and financially, uh, that can help to shift your perceptions, too. Product managers have this uh, information. So what do customers do with the features you build? How do they describe the impact on them? You know, so what emotional impact do customers describe? So uh, th if you can get into the field to talk to customers and hear from them, you know, from their own mouth what the impact was that you had, all the better. So lastly, um, and, and then we'll uh, take any other questions that you have, um, being clear about your own priorities is really, really important. This is what helps you to understand what is on your must-have list for compensation, 
uh, what is on the nice to have list? What can you give uh, and what do you have to get? And it sounds obvious, a lot of people don't do this. So our natural inclination in any negotiation is to focus on the financials, as I mentioned earlier. You know, the, the, the reality is that we're more, more likely to stall in a negotiation if, if each side, you and the, the employer, becomes entrenched in the position of a particular number that they want. So instead of focusing on the number of your position, focus on what, you, what that salary, what that compensation is trying to satisfy. In order to, and once you do that, you can identify some other creative ways of achieving those same ends. So, you know, the way that our minds tend to work is the, every position that we take, every reaction or opinion or ask we make uh, is really emblematic of thoughts and feelings that are below the surface of our minds. We have, we have thoughts, we have feelings, we have concerns, we have worries, and those are reflective of what we ultimately believe, what are highest priorities, what principles are, are beliefs do you have that are driving those thoughts and feelings about that position you're taking? And ultimately, we all are just trying to satisfy some, some deeper desire that we have, some intention or motivation. So those are what I refer to as interests. Those are what you're ultimately trying to satisfy. So um, you can ask yourself questions, open-ended questions, when you take a position about what are you really trying to satisfy to clarify in your own mind what that really is? So let's take an example. Let's say you ask, uh, I want 15000 more per year. It might be you feel about this because, or I'm sorry, how do you feel about this? It might be that you feel really strongly uh, because you feel you deserve this. And if you ask yourself, okay, what does this mean to me? What, what's important to me about getting what I deserve? You might think, Okay, this this will help uh, this will help demonstrate that the company values the contributions I'm making, and what am I trying to achieve by having those contributions valued by the company? I just I just want to be recognized at the end of the day. So the whole purpose of this is once you know that you um, are ultimately just trying to be recognized, whatever that need is, you might come up with all kinds of different ways of satisfying that. You might ask for a greater responsibility. You might ask for a different title. You might want to negotiate for visibility on a project or perhaps professional development, um, access to certain resources, maybe more PTO if you can. The more you can get below the ask, uh, the, the more you'll have clarity over what's important and then be able to creatively think of options to achieve it. So with that, let's, let me pause there, and uh, if there's some questions you have, we can turn to those. Yes, lots of questions. Um, so for individuals that are working on large projects, Jonathan, with many coworkers, how do they differentiate their particular specific impact from the rest of the team when it comes to increased revenue or decreased costs, for example? How can they really sort of identify their own individual value to that teamwork? Yeah, so, the, I mean, the, the trick typically is to find some part of the release that you really owned in some way, that you had, um, you know, a majority of the impact on. And it could just be one feature. And then to trace the impacts of that feature, it could be the financial impact and it could be the impacts to customers. So the first thing to do is to ask your, the product manager or marketing manager you're working with, what's the impact of the customer of this? And if we had to buy this from somebody outside the company, what would we pay for this? And then to ensure that, you know, you're in the field talking to customers, which is just generally a good thing uh, for everyone at the company, um, and to, to talk to one of the customers that you learn uses this feature, and then actually just ask them some open-ended questions about it. How do you use this? What impact does this have? What, what impact would it have if, it, if you didn't have this anymore? So just a few ideas. Great. Um, for people that are working in uh, small organizations that might be tightly fit, 
Um, how do you deal with negotiations when you are dealing with people that are not necessarily HR or you're having to negotiate directly with your boss or a partner in a firm and you don't have that middle person and those relationships are very valuable to the integrity of your job? How do you start those conversations with those individuals? Let me just make sure I understand the question. So you, there isn't a um, an objective third party who can do this. You have tight relationships with the people you're negotiating with. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So I think um, the first thing is, uh, and this is this is probably the most common scenario actually, because even when there is another objective third party, usually you know our manager or the person we have the best relationship with advocates on our behalf to that person. So in effect, we are talking to, you know, um, the person that we have the best relationship with. Um, so, it, you know, some of the things you can do uh, to prepare is first write out an agenda for the meeting that you want to have to discuss this and make sure that your manager or whoever that person is that you have the relationship with, they know that you want to meet specifically for this purpose so that they're not surprised. Uh, so send it, send it to them at least a, a day in advance. Um, in your own mind, make sure you're a, you know what's the outcome you want from this one meeting and be realistic about that. If there is somebody else who's going to have to decide or a bunch of people on a committee, you're not going to get an immediate answer in that meeting. So what can you expect as, a, as an outcome? Um, when you meet with the, this person, talk about the elephants in the room. You know, this is a kind of a difficult conversation for me. I'm not used to talking about this. Um, start with the facts. You know, here's what I did over the last year. Here's the impact that I saw I had. Here's, here's the evidence that I, I'm looking at and lay it out for them. Talk about your feelings about that. You know, I, I feel like this is really important evidence. I'm, I'm really seeing the impact in it, and I'm feeling like this this uh, raise that I'm asking for is really justified based on my reading of these facts. Understand uh, them and their feelings. How how are they feeling about the data you've laid out? How are they feeling about this conversation and the position you're in? And then lastly. Uh, try to talk through possible actions and what process uh, would be followed to get you an answer or at least a, um, you know, uh, a, a, a negotiated uh, uh, a counter offer. So, you know, what does the process look like? How does the company arrive at a decision in this case? And what are you, you know, my manager or colleague, what are you going to do? What is the next step going to look like? What can I expect? So there are just a, a few ideas, but certainly um, be honest and open and try to understand the other person through every step of the way. Thanks, Jonathan. Switching to your concept of clarity and sort of the self-reflection piece, what are the types of questions, um, maybe even simple questions, that someone can ask themselves to learn what is the clarity that they want? Yeah, so um, there's another way that you can go about creating clarity for yourself in terms of your ultimate interests here. Um, you know, the way that I presented here was to start with the, the ask that you have and work backwards by asking yourself questions. But another way is, is to make a list of, you know, all the major accomplishments of your life that you're really, really proud of and uh, that you enjoyed the most working on. It can include work, volunteering, hobbies, time when you were at school, anything that gave you a sense of accomplishment and that was really important to you, however you define important. Uh, and so try to write out uh, 25 of these things over four or five days, just as you're in the shower, get it going throughout your day, bring a pad and write down these accomplishments as you think about them. And then Pick the, the top seven most important ones, however you define important. Write a paragraph about each, and then look for what, what's in common with those seven. What, what do those seven accomplishments say about your values, 
what you believe in, your priorities in life, the needs that you have? How are, how are those realized in some way through those seven accomplishments? And that can be another clue for ultimately what's most important to you. It sounds like we have a lot of seasoned uh, negotiators out there, or at least job seekers. What's the best advice that you would have when your potential employer asks you the dreaded question, what, what's your desired compensation? You know, I would, uh, and, and I know that that is a tough question, I would give them a range. And I would, I would, I would uh, again, leverage your, your uh, legitimacy here. So show them the research. Come prepared to answer that question. So what, what are the ranges of compensation that you see for this position? And, you know, there's no reason to, to include, you know, what's below the mean. Uh, but you could give them a range of what the mean is to the high end. And if you believe that, in fact, that there are things that, that you bear, you know, there are skills and special experiences that you have that are not commonly found, you might even revise that slightly. Uh, but oftentimes that range is important because they're trying to anchor you. And so uh, if, if your range includes the median in the middle, half of that range is going to be below median, and if they try to split the difference at some point, you'll, you'll end up just getting um, an average salary. Great. Thank you. And I think we have time for one more question. So for someone who's working at an organization where they're doing a lot of layoffs over the past several years, um, often those organizations tend to not promote people. So when people are trying to think about what's next for them, should they be negotiating for a specific amount or should they just be thinking about opportunity and growth? Are there other tangibles that can be negotiated that may not specifically be related to salary? So this is in the context of a downsizing company? Yes. Well, um, I mean, there is a Chinese proverb that um, that in every crisis there is opportunity. I mean, we, it, it sounds like a cliche, but that certainly can be true in a, in uh, in a downsizing. And I think um, it starts with you know understanding what needs you have, and, and through some of these exercises that I I described here, what needs are you trying to satisfy, and then thinking creatively. Uh, for what are the different dimensions you could achieve it. So I, I gave um, on this particular slide six different examples. What, what uh, variations in, in responsibilities or role um, exist that, or you could imagine that would help? Um, what, what variations in title would help you? Um, are there particular projects in downsizing um, that very well could be some high visibility projects that are strategic and critical? How can you negotiate your way in to play a leadership role on those? Um, uh, if, if there's opportunities for professional development or access, you can uh, negotiate for those. I think in, a, in the case of a downsizing company, if survival's on the line, you may really need to create alternatives for yourself outside the company. And if it's getting, um, you know, know what your limit is, if it's getting too dicey, uh, be more active in creating viable alternatives so that you have some leverage when you go to the company. Make sure you've got leverage when you start to make your asks, because every time you make an ask, you're in a negotiation. That's a great point, I think. And with that, uh, our program is out of time. Thank you so much, Jonathan, again, for your expertise. For individuals looking to follow up with Jonathan, that information is available on our website. We will be sending out the slides to the presentation via email, and a recorded version of today's webinar will be available on our website on the YouTube channel for the MIT Alumni Association. Thank you so much, and have a great afternoon, everybody. Bye-bye.